Hi, today I'll be going over a minimal solution to this Kaggle competition. The competition is called Global Weed Detection, and we'll be detecting bounding boxes of plants from images. Now, feel free to check out the link below to get access to this kernel so that you can run along on, on Kaggle as I go through these steps. Now, if you're running on Kaggle, um, make sure you have the internet access enabled, and this is because the solution I'm going over is based on fine-tuning a pre-trained faster ICNN model, so we'll need the internet to download the weights. And since we'll be processing lots of images, ideally you should run this with the GPU enabled. So, first things first, I'm going to load some of the libraries I'll be using here. Now, for the machine learning framework, I'll be using PyTorch, and like I said, we'll be fine-tuning a pre-trained faster ICNN model, so I'll be importing those here as well. For the fine-tuning stage, We'll be modifying the FastRCNN predictor, so I'm also importing the FastRCNN predictor class here. Now, having run this, let's go on to check out the training labels that we have. So here I'm going to use pandas to open the train.csv file. And we can see that for the training labels, we have the image IDs, which correspond to the image, uh, the JPEG image file names here. And also for each image ID, we have multiple bounding box definitions. And these are in the format of coordinates of the top left corner, the width and the height of the bounding box. All right. Next, let's create some functions to load images and try it out on an example. All right. So I'm using OpenCV um, for loading the image here, which by default loads the image in the BGR uh, format. And I'm just making sure to convert it to RGB. And we can see that here, everything looks pretty natural. Okay. Now, next up, I'm going to parse the bounding boxes. So since the original data is in CSV, I'll need to parse the strings uh, to actually get the floating point values. Next, I need to convert that format of the top left corner width and height into the format where we just have the coordinates of this top left corner and the bottom right corner. And this is the form that's expected by the faster RCNN predictor we'll be using. And hence why we're creating this function here. Now, having these functions created, next I'm going to apply these to the pandas data frame and have a look to see that everything is done correctly. So first we can see that from this string, we've extracted the correct floating point values. And then we've used these parameters to further infer the coordinates of the bottom right corner. All right, so now we have the bounding box parsed, parsed and um, we can load the images. So the next thing is to create a function to draw the bounding boxes on the image. And in here, we'll do it for a particular example. All right, so you see there's quite some variation here in the aspect ratio of the bounding boxes, uh, as well as the size. Uh, let's run that again to see that we're able to do it correctly for more than just one example. All right, that's good. Okay, next I'm going to define the model that we'll be training and eventually using to detect bounding boxes of wheat plants. So here I'll be using the faster RCNN model, which has been pre-trained on the Cocoa dataset. So it's going to take some time to download. And once that's done downloading, we're going to expand it and have a look at the model definition. So we can see the backbone here it's using the Fisher Pyramid Network. And since this has been pre-trained on the Cocoa dataset, it's safe to assume that the weights here are a good enough starting point for our training as well. What we do need to change, however, is all the way down here at the bottom where we have the bounding box predictors. Now here for the, in the predictor layer, we have two outputs. We have the class cores, which have 91 output features, and these correspond to the number of classes in the Cocoa dataset. For each one of the classes, there are four parameters for the bounding boxes, and this is why we have the 364 output features for the bounding box predictions. What we, what we need to do is to change um, this number of outputs to what matches our data set. And in our data set, we have the wheat class and the background class. So we just have the two classes. And hence, what we're going to do is replace the bounding box predictor here with a new instance of the FastRCNN predictor that we loaded earlier. And the number of input features is going to be the same as before, 
so that it's compatible with the rest of the network that we're not changing. And the number of classes we have, however, is, is just a two, which corresponds to the number of classes in our data set. So we're going to make the modification and expand it again just to see that you know we've done the right modifications. And we see here two classes for the uh, class scores and eight features. So for the bounding box prediction, four for each one of the classes. Okay. And next up, we're going to create the data loader. And here we're going to make, create some functionalities that will help us load batches of data and feed to our model during training as well as during validation. So first things first, I'm going to see if the GPU is available and store this designating device in a variable. And then I'm also going to create this function here, which is going to help me move batches of data to the designated device. Next, I'm going to split my data into a training subset and a validation subset. And this is just so that once the model is done training, we can validate on some novel data that the model has not seen during training to make sure that it hasn't just kind of memorized the labels that are given in the training data set. Here, I'm using an 80-20 split. So 20% of the data is not going to be seen during training, but it only be used during validation. And let's give this a run. Okay, so we can see we have roughly 2,700 unique training samples and around 700 validation samples. Now, having split the data into training and validation subsets, Next, I'm going to inherit from the PyTorch dataset class to create this class here called the weak dataset. And this is going to allow us to work with the PyTorch data loader class, which kind of more automatically generates batches of data for us, where we just have to describe how to load a single sample. And to do that, we're going to override the getItem function here, where in particular, we need to pay attention to kind of preparing our data from the way it's been loaded into a format that PyTorch expects. Now, in particular, our pre-trained model expects the range of the image values to be between zero and one, which is why we're doing the scaling here. Next, since our data is loaded in the OpenCV format, we also will make the permutation of the axis of the image so that it matches the PyTorch expected format. And then for every record that we have for this particular image, we're going to extract the coordinates of the top left corner, the coordinates of the bottom right corner. And then since each one of these boxes corresponds to a weight class, we're going to create labels with the index one, which corresponds to the weight class. And we don't have to explicitly create any labels for the background class. So this is all we'll have to do for this step. All right. With this weak data set class defined, next I'm going to create two instances one for the training and one for validation. And now I'm going to pass them on to the PyTorch data loader constructor so that I can get the corresponding training and validation data loaders. And here, due to the limited size of the RAM in the Kaggle kernel, depending on if the training is on CPU or GPU, I'll be using different batch sizes. Also, this collate function that we see here, it's going to bring together images with different numbers of bounding boxes into the same batch smoothly. Okay, now having created the training and validation data loaders, next let's iterate through some examples to see if we've done everything correctly. So here I'm going to iterate through the training data loader and then uh, with the sample that's generated, I'm going to convert it back to the format that we can plot. And you can see here that we've subsequently plotted the bounding boxes on the image correctly. So to double check, let's run through another example and see how it looks. Okay, good. We're now ready to carry on to the next step, which is finally our training. So to start things off, I'm going to create this optimizer here where I'll be using stochastic gradient descent to optimize over all the parameters in my model. So this will include those parts which have the pre-trained weights as well. And I'll be using these hyperparameters here for the learning rate and momentum, respectively. If you're going to be running this on the CPU, it's really going to take a lot of time. So I highly recommend running this with the GPU enabled, uh, such as I have here on the Cabo kernel under the accelerator option. Here for the actual training loop, we're going to iterate through all the samples in our training data loader 
and we're going to use our function that we generated earlier to move the batch of data to the designated device. Then we're going to pass it through the model to obtain the loss for each one of the images in the batch. And then we're going to average over the losses and then take a step in the direction to minimize that loss. This is going to take quite some time. So I recommend you know, to get this running and then take a break, maybe drink some coffee and we'll come back when it's ready. All right, welcome back. Now, after around 10 minutes of training, uh, we've managed to go through three epochs of the entire uh, training data set that we have. And here we can see that during the training phase, the loss has been gradually decreasing. So let's now have a look and see what the model has learned on our validation data set. So here, first things first, I'm going to turn the state of the model to evaluation so that we don't unnecessarily calculate all the gradients as we're passing the images through the model. And I'm going to create this generator here that's going to yield me samples of the image and ground truth bounding boxes and the predicted boxes by the model. So let's make this generator here and go through a couple of examples and see how our model has learned. Okay. So yeah, it, it looks like the recall is relatively good. Here we have in green, the ground truth bounding boxes and in red are the predictions as given by the model. And we can see that when it, wherever there is a green box, so a ground truth wheat plant, uh, there's some kind of a red box, so a prediction around it. That's kind of similar. So here, not so much the case, uh, but in some cases it actually gets the bounding box uh, prediction pretty closely. Um, we, what we do have an issue with is the precision on the other hand. We see there's lots of spurious detections here where there actually isn't a ground truth wheat plant. So there's, there's definitely room for improvement. For now, let's save the state of this model. And in a separate kernel, we can then load up this now fine-tuned model and maybe perform further training, or we can run it on the test data set that we have. Then with the predictions, we can actually pass it on to the capital judge and see how well we're doing just with this current state of the model. So I'll run this here. And feel free to check out this link here for a kernel that performs the inference on the test data and then passes it on to the capital judge. Now, in the meantime, please feel free to check out any one of these resources which I found useful while preparing this kernel. Now, if you like this episode, please feel free to give it a thumbs up and click the subscribe button to stay up to date with my latest developments.